Welcome to Illinois Lawmakers' weekly coverage of the spring session of the Illinois General Assembly. I'm Jack Titchener along with Amanda Vinicky of Channel 11's Chicago Tonight. Amanda, great to have you back. I'm glad to be back with you, Jack, especially for this exciting time in Illinois politics. <laughs> This has been kind of a, a, an interesting week. I mean, we always say that, but uh, one of the state agencies that hardly ever gets any public attention, the Illinois Prisoner Review Board, has been on the spotlight for the last several days here. Uh, the board has lost its quorum. Uh, there was uh, action earlier this week. One of the governor's appointees was rejected by the Senate. Another one uh, resigned just before uh, the, the uh, Senate took up the appointments and uh, the governor actually pulled one a few days back. What's going on? Well, the resignation, pulling of a nomination is a recognition that these appointees were going to be in trouble, despite the fact that you, of course, have Democrats dominating all of Illinois government, including having a super majority in the Illinois Senate. So while you've had Republicans trying to make hay about the constitution of the Prisoner Review Board for some time, didn't really get a lot of attraction, in part because I think it's been confusing, in part because, as you noted, this is a state agency that really doesn't get a lot of attention, and also because, of course, Republicans are in the super minority. So you've had Governor J.B. Pritzker this week during a press conference that um, uh, was actually meant to highlight the anniversary 100 years of the Illinois State Police and his um, stance on crime instead sort of got that message blurred. The governor trying to say that this is the GOP. In fact, he pointedly called the GOP, the GQP, apparently a reference, calling Republicans members of QAnon. Republicans are saying, hey, wait a second, we don't have the votes to kill a, to, to, to kill a nomination. To uh, Instead, it was Democrats who did not support nominees by Pritzker to this board. I think that that is um, somewhat, yes, a recognition that perhaps uh, the Pritzker administration, despite being aware that this was on the horizon, did not put uh, proper attention and internal lobbying to members of the Senate to try and get them on board, but also a larger issue showing that crime is most certainly on voters' minds and therefore it is also on the minds of elected officials in particularly suburban Democrats and those who voted for that safety act, the big uh, criminal black caucus push measure at the end of last year that is still on the way to going into effect, that they're afraid voters aren't going to like that and that they want to do what they can at this point to appear, to appear that they are tough on crime. The rub against some of these nominees was that they had that they had voted to because, by the way, they've been serving on the board despite not having Senate confirmation at this point in time, that they were light on crime by having let out of prison individuals, including those who had killed police. Uh, the, the governor, again, sticking up for it and not necessarily begrudging the decisions. Really, he is framing this as something political. Um, he's got some options, of course. Uh, he could name uh, all nine uh, new appointees here in at any point. And they, the, the deal is they can sit in that position until 60 session days expire. So we're at the end of this uh, session, practically. Uh, veto session's up in the fall, so conceivably they could serve well into next calendar year. Yeah, you're, I imagine, going to see Democrats, Pritzker included, doing all they can to avoid this issue going forward, at least until after the elections. As you pointed out, it's not just 60 calendar days, 60 business days. It is 60 session days. Right. We have basically, a, give or take, a week left, as you and I are taping this, of session days right now. And so this can be pushed off far into the horizon, one might expect the governor to have to make appointments regardless. As I noted, you can have people serving on these state agency boards for quite some time before they need Senate approval. And even then, you can kind of do a trick where you pull a name from nomination and then resubmit that person. And that allows another way of getting around this clock, be it because you don't want to bring attention to it, be it because the Senate doesn't get around to it, whatever it may be, we are certainly going to see 
this pushed off until after the election. The question will be who does the governor appoint and when, because he is, of course, trying to win re-election right now, but this is dicey. He's looking at the sort of more progressive flank of the Democratic Party, as well as, as I just noted, those who are maybe more moderate and who are more um, concerned about more tough on crime. And yet you don't want there to be any inaction, <coughs> pardon me, because um, then the board won't have enough quorum to meet and that will be a story that makes the press. Amanda, thank you so much for your expertise and your timing. Hope, you're getting, hope you get to feeling better soon. Thank you so much. Democratic Senate President Don Harmon of Oak Park is our guest on this week's Illinois Lawmakers and the lead off position. Great to have you back on the program, Mr. President. Glad to be with you, Jack. Thanks for having me. Um, as we sit down to talk on a Thursday morning, there are nine days left before the spring session is supposed to wrap up on April 8th. Where do things stand right now as uh, we look at, this, at the big ticket uh, items like getting the budget taken care of? Uh, I fully expect we're going to adjourn on April 8th as scheduled with a very uh, responsible balanced budget uh, heading to the governor's desk. Uh, it's, uh, it's, we're, I would not have predicted two years ago as we uh, uh, were careening through the first days of the pandemic and imagining the economy going off the cliff that uh, we'd be here where we are today. But uh, through a, an awful lot of responsible decision making, uh, we have uh, reached a point where we're going to pass uh, one of the best budgets uh, we've seen in my time in Springfield. Uh, we have moved from uh, chronic deficits to uh, expecting a $1.7 billion surplus. Uh, our bill backlog for all practical purposes is gone. Uh, and we're going to be able to live up to some promises, increasing our education funding for early childhood through high school, pursuant to our landmark uh, funding law from five years ago a real investment in higher education scholarships for, for uh, families, uh, recognizing that that was an area that was neglected for far too long, um, and meaningful relief for taxpayers. The governor led his budget address with a proposal for a billion dollars in relief, uh, relief at the gas pump, relief at the grocery store, some relief for property taxpayers. So we're working through that now to make sure that uh, that relief gets to the families in Illinois who need it. It's interesting. You mentioned the, the contrast between uh, just a few years in, in, in budget making in the state and the impact of COVID. The late uh, budget director, Steve Schnorf, said it was getting to the point where the budget negotiations were about allocating pain and scarcity. This is a complete turnaround. It, it really is. And uh, again, we, we battened down the hatches uh, during the pandemic. Uh, in the end, I, I, well, many people, many people suffered, and I don't ever want to minimize that. Uh, the economy as a whole did better, and, and uh, some businesses and some individuals did uh, really well. So uh, we've been able to use that to the state's advantage, and uh, again, paying off our bills, putting money in the rainy day fund, making an advance payment on our pensions, uh, lots of good things, a lot of responsible budget making going on right now in Springfield. Uh, a lot of this has been targeted toward re repairing some of the harm that was done in the uh, budget impasse and the, the COVID constraints. Uh, the Department of Children and Family Services, a lot of the social services uh, safety net got shredded uh, over the last five to 10 years. And uh, so there's gonna be more money there for the social services. There will be, and you know, that's one of those ironies is we, we spent so much time outsourcing the uh, performance of those social safety net uh, uh, responsibilities to not-for-profits and healthcare providers. Uh, and then we don't uh, pay them what they should be paid to do that work. So we're trying to make up for that. We've, we've been able to enact some uh, modest rate increases to the people who provide those services on the front lines. Uh, we are trying to rebuild a, a, a fragile safety net. And as you said, the budget impasses did it no help. Um, there's some unexpected drama here in the last few days of the session when it comes to the state's prisoner review board. Uh, that's an agency of state government that doesn't get a whole lot of public attention, but the board's now down to six members, if I'm correct on that, and that's not enough to hold a forum to handle cases. Two of Governor Pritzker's appointees are now off the board. One was voted down uh, in the Senate earlier this week. Uh, another uh, resigned before the vote. 
and another was pulled by Governor Pritzker before it even came to a vote. Where do things stand with that now? Uh, a very contentious issue, certainly, but I want to be clear, there, there was never a caucus position. I voted to support the governor, uh, but each member of the Senate voted uh, his or her conscience and constituency. Uh, so we're looking forward. Uh, we're expecting uh, new nominees, and uh, we, we hope to be able to make sure that uh, we help the governor live up to the, the responsibility so that the board can continue to function. How does this mirror Senate Democrats' concerns about how Democrats are going to be positioned on public safety and crime issues going into a very contentious uh, November midterms election? Uh, crime is an issue we're seeing across the state and across the country, finally. And, and we're sensitive to that anxiety. Um, you know, on the, uh, on the one hand, we are very proud of the work we did uh, two years ago on the Safety Act, uh, bringing uh, responsible policing and justice uh, improvements to the system. That, that's not in any way at odds with public safety. We need to continue to make some investments there. And I think that we, we can do that in a way that addresses people's concerns. I'm looking forward to uh, the, uh, the, the new bail model where uh, dangerous people will be kept in jail uh, even if they have the resources to bail out uh, instead of the current model that puts dangerous people back on the street. Um, so we're going to continue to try to, to give law enforcement the tools and we're going to fund the police. We're going to make sure that uh, we're uh, living up to our commitments there as well and that uh, police officers and law enforcement agencies uh, have the money they need to uh, police responsibly with an eye towards justice. I want to circle back to uh, a bill that was passed last week, and that has to do with the uh, uh, spending of $2.7 billion from the, the American Recovery uh, Program to shore up the unemployment insurance fund, as well as make a, a dent in some of the other areas that the, the state has uh, some uh, shortages in. Um, Republicans said, hey, the overall debt is $4.5 billion, $2.7 billion. Isn't going to isn't going to make the changes we need. We're we're worried about increases on uh, tax increases on businesses and cutting benefits for employees. Well, Jack, let me start with the, your lead in there. The the bill wasn't about only the unemployment insurance trust fund. We also uh, it invested in uh, the retirement security for uh, police officers and teachers and correction officers. Uh, people who don't often think we have their retirement security at the top of our list. Uh, we paid bills that were owed to doctors and dentists and healthcare providers who uh, provided services to public employees without being paid. That was a very responsible thing to do. And we also made sure that parents who had set aside money for their kids' college education and the College of Illinois program uh, will get the deal they bargained for. We, we uh, backfilled that, uh, that deficit. On the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund, uh, that, it's an odd situation. It's, a, it's always been a contained system entirely financed by the employers and negotiated with the employees. The $2.7 billion that we put in is the first ever infusion of public money. And it was designed to take the edge off and take the problem back down to a size that the system has been able to digest before. So we'll allow the agreed bill process where employers and employees sit down and, and negotiate how to parcel out uh, the liability for the, uh, for the fix. Um, but that $2.7 billion was a, a landmark change the first time ever, and it recognizes that um, the unemployment insurance system wasn't built to withstand a pandemic. Uh, and so it was important to, to make sure we, we invested that money. Will this work for uh, the long term? It should. And again, years? the, the, uh, the 2008 recession created a very similar size challenge for the unemployment insurance trust fund. And the agreed bill process did what it was supposed to do. It, it created uh, a, a way to finance that responsibly and built uh, some sustainability into it. Now, that was all upended by the pandemic. No, no one built a system for mass unemployment simultaneously, um, something maybe we should learn from. But in the short term, we're on a path towards fixing this problem in the same way we've done it before. Senator uh, Harmon, thank you so much. I know your time is at a premium here as the uh, clock ticks down to adjournment. We certainly appreciate you uh, taking part on this week's Illinois Lawmakers. Delighted to be with you, thanks. Deputy Democratic uh, Senate Majority Leader Laura Murphy of Des Plaines, who serves on the Senate Higher Education Committee, joins us now on Illinois Lawmakers. Senator, welcome to the program. 
Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, in years past, uh, in times of fiscal uh, constraints in the state of Illinois, the higher education budget was always uh, kind of a, a discussion of points of scare, uh, scarcity. But this year, with the surpluses that are coming in, the economy is uh, rebounding in the state of Illinois. Um, the state of Illinois stands to do better for the state's colleges and universities and community colleges. Absolutely correct. You know, we have the some of the best uh, colleges, universities, um, community college programs, I think that rival any state. Unfortunately, when we, when I first came into the legislature and there was no budget uh, during the past administration, we decimated our whole higher education system because students then felt th that instability and sought um, colleges and, and um, higher education programs in other states. And we as a state, you know, I, this is one thing I've never understood. We make this huge investment in our kids from K through 12, and maybe now we'll go into early childhood, but from K through 12, and then we watch it walk out the door to other states. So it, even if you were to take a real fiscal approach to this, it made no sense that we would not fund our universities of higher education and watch that brain drain, as well as that financial investment, leave the state. So we're looking at a $2.2 billion uh, higher ed budget for the coming fiscal year. That's uh, up by at least $200 million over the current fiscal year. What are some of the program priorities that you expect to be funded this year? Well, uh, it, it's our goal that our colleges and universities will be able to keep tuition flat so that we are competitive with surrounding states. We're trying to also provide some assistance for kids in textbooks and all the other fees and, and living expenditures that go along with those programs so that we'll be able to, um, you know, again, keep them in Illinois and be competitive with our surrounding states. There's a, about a 5% increase overall for higher education uh, in the, the new state budget. And there's um, something like a $122 million increase for the monetary award program that helps uh, lower income students and their families uh, get uh, their start in higher education. Yeah, the MAP grants are hugely important for kids. That allows us to expand the MAP program so that I think that we'll be able to increase by almost 24,000 kids that can now become eligible for MAP grants, and that's huge. And, and MAP grants provides that additional assistance that lower, um, middle, lower to lower middle income families um, can receive to assist with paying for higher education. And if we look at the U of I system alone, you know, the projections are that I think they return $13 billion to the economy every year. So for us to make this small investment, it's, you know, look at how many folded it is uh, returned to the economy in Illinois. And, and I've always been an advocate that if we invest in kids, then that investment returns. And, and we see that when kids stay in Illinois, they go attend Illinois colleges and universities, and by the way, get an awesome education so that they are employable, businesses then stay where the employee base is at. And if we look at the return from COVID, no matter what business line someone is in, we're seeing the need for employees. And if we can produce those here, we can make them homegrown and then have them stay in Illinois. That feeds our um, job programs, that feeds our business environment, and it spurs on to feed the whole state economy. I'm glad you made that point because there was a recent Moody's investors uh, report that said uh, universities like the University of Illinois and Southern Illinois University Carbondale are major drivers of local economies in their parts of the state. Absolutely. And, and again, I just had numbers quickly for the U of I system, but imagine when you put that, and that only includes one public university, that $13 billion. Imagine then add all of the, all the other publics and privates on top of it. The, the, the return is huge. And our businesses don't thrive without that employee base. You know, when, when you talk to employers and they're looking at, um, 
at uh, uh, entering into a, a particular state into developing a business in a particular state, one of the top three elements that they need is an employee base. And, and higher we can education. provide it. Higher education is one of the underpinnings of that. Senator Laura uh, Murphy, thank you so much for your time on Illinois Lawmakers. We certainly appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Continuing on the subject of higher education on Illinois Lawmakers, we're talking with State Senator Terry Bryant of Murfreesboro. Uh, she's one of the uh, Senate GOP's uh, point persons on higher education. She has Southern Illinois University Carbondale in her district as well as several community colleges. So I know this is a subject that's uh, very near and dear to your heart, Senator. Yes, it is, Jack. And thank you for having me to talk about this today. It is a very important subject uh, as our universities uh, and community colleges, but more so the universities play such an important role as economic engines for the communities that they are located in. We were just talking to uh, your Democratic colleague, Senator uh, uh, Laura Murphy of Des Plaines about the, the role that these uh, institutions of higher education play in the local economies. As, as you look at uh, SIU Carbondale, for example, how does that uh, impact on the area's economy ripple out over the southern quarter, uh, actually southern half of the state of Illinois when you take in the School of Medicine in Springfield? Well, uh, I when you think about the number of people who come into the community who are coming from other parts of the state, other parts of the country, other parts of the world, uh, it first works as an economic engine in introducing the world to Southern Illinois. Uh, a lot of my colleagues here in, uh, in Springfield uh, who visit Southern Illinois for the first time are really shocked by the fact that it's the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. So we have our version of the little mountains, right? Uh, and um, they're surprised to see the, you know, the, the beauty of it. But you gotta get them there first to see it. But in, in regard to the local economy, it isn't just the businesses that are on the strip, say in Carbondale, it's also those who live and work in the region. So uh, properties that used to be owned by people who lived in the region, but are now rental properties, and then um, the people who own those, just trying to get those properties rented. So, so we see a rural version of urban blight just because uh, a university town might not be as healthy as it once was. And we just saw overnight um, a, a very sobering uh, announcement that Lincoln College, uh, a private institution in Lincoln, Illinois, named after Mr. Lincoln in his own lifetime, is, is going to shutter later this year. Yeah, it's, you know, it's devastating to a community when any school closes, whether it's K through 12, community college, but certainly when, uh, when a, 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 a institution of learning such as Lincoln uh, or that stature of, facility, stature of facility closes, it has a tremendous impact on everything in the community. So uh, once again, we, you know, we wanna make sure that our um, institutions of higher education remain healthy. And uh, we have a responsibility to the public universities and colleges uh, at a level, you know, here at the state level to make sure that we are funding them adequately. But we also wanna make sure that that funding is used appropriately. For instance, uh, there, there was an article recently that talked about uh, the pay of uh, those working within institutions. So whether it's a dean or a college, uh, uh, pro professor or whether it's at the level of a uh, chancellor or a president, we as lawmakers want to make sure that the money is being spent appropriately and that it's actually going to help the students that are there to have a high level of education uh, and that the money is actually being used for that. And we're, we're seeing in this new budget proposal that higher education institutions will be seeing something like a 5% increase. This is a big turnaround from a few years ago when we were in the budget impasse when higher education wasn't funded at all for a couple of years. Yeah, so they took a, they took a hard hit uh, through, you know, uh, going all the way back to the budget impasse, but they've taken a pretty hard hit during uh, COVID. And yeah. in reading the article about Lincoln College, they, they mentioned the fact that, uh, just prior to COVID, they had their highest enrollment in history for that college. And then we hit COVID. And of course, 
Uh, they just, they weren't able to advertise. They weren't able to bring students in. Uh, so just using that was as an example, that facility as an example, all the colleges, all the universities were hit in the same way. So we have to rebuild them in a way that gets everybody healthy again. And then of course gets the communities and regions around them healthy as well. So we have a lot of work to do. We have about a half a minute left. Uh, there's uh, an additional $200 million or more, like I said, a 5% increase for colleges and universities in this year's budget. Is that sustainable? Uh, we had a big, inflow, a big influx of federal uh, relief funds. Can we keep this going to keep higher education healthy? Well, I hope so, but um, obviously, you know, we, I, I've been uh, kind of pushing against what the member uh, pork projects have been. We've seen a tremendous amount of, it's actually a billion dollars in uh, pork projects for members of the majority party. And so I think as we move forward with the funds that we have to work with from ARPA, from Cures, and from uh, some of the windfall dollars that we're seeing in the budget right now and revenues coming in, we gotta make sure that they are appropriately spent and making sure that our, uh, uh, our higher institutions, our higher institutions of learning are adequately funded would be one of those as opposed to member pork projects. Senator Bryant, thank you so much for your time on Illinois Lawmakers. We always appreciate uh, you spending some time with us.